Dakia Pi Chante Washtena Pa Chuzepe. My name is Serene Thanalk, and I come from the Ihangtuan Lakota Oyate and the Sichango Lakota Oyate. It's very important for me to greet all of you in my Lakota and Lakota language because it's not only a connection to my cultural identity, my family, and who I am today, but it's a connection to my ancestors. Given everything that our ancestors went through as indigenous people, it's a revolutionary act to speak the same language that they spoke. Those very words were attempted to be eradicated through assimilation. So it's a great honor of mine to be able to talk about the topic of intergenerational trauma and healing. When I was in my 20s, I began to experience a lot of really, really difficult emotional and psychological things. I was confused, I was having trauma symptoms, I felt alone, um, I was away from everyone. I was living in Boston at the time. And I remember one night, I had a dream. And in this dream, it brought great insight into the path that I would forge ahead personally and professionally. In this dream, I was at the bottom of the ocean floor. I was looking around me, and it was literally, literally at the bottom of the ocean. And next to me, there were 13 other people. I didn't know those people, but we, both, we, we all had an understanding that we were there for a reason. In front of us stood this very tall, beautiful, slender woman who had long, long dark hair, and it went all the way down to her feet, and her hair would kind of move around, and she had a long, dark blue dress on, and her, her dress flowed. And she said to us, not with her words, but through her mind, to our hearts and minds, we understood. She said, this water that we, we are in right now, it is within your bodies, and it is within the, the earth body. It is very sacred. And this water, with the energy that each human has inside of them, with set intention, you can create different things with this water. And she started to use her hands, and she started to make beautiful formations, and we were watching her create all of these things. And then she stepped forward closer to us, and she started to create a circle. And in that circle, a tornado formed. And it was a little tornado, and we were watching her hold this. And she took that tornado and she threw it down on the ocean floor, and it cracked a huge divide. And when that happened, a huge tsunami wave came up. And in that wave, it was as far as you could see on both sides and as high as the sky, and she froze the wave. And she walked over to me, and she said, do you see this wave? And, and I told her, I said, I'm terrified. I don't know where my family is. I don't know where anyone is. I'm terrified. I'm going to die, and they're going to die. And she told me, this huge fear, this wave that you feel, is what your people feel every single day because of the effects of everything that you have been through. It's grief. It's shame. It's addiction, it's death, it's genocide. It's all of those things that you feel. And I said to her, when this wave comes down, I'm going to die. I'm not going to survive. And she reminded me that those things are not true. You don't want to get swept away with a wave. You have more tools and resiliency through your lineage than you can even imagine. And she handed me this stick, almost like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. It became very, very um, majestical. But it was, it was truly very powerful. There was something in that. She gave it to me, and she said, you stand strong. You stand strong because when this wave comes down, if you believe and you hold on to that, your, your ancestors will be with you. And the wave came down, and I was OK. When I woke up, I had profound clarity about the work I wanted to do and the work I knew I needed to do personally to become a better person, a better woman, and eventually one day a better mother. As we talk about these experiences of trauma that I'm mentioning, we have to kind of break it down a little bit first. So the first one is what you hear um, the most, which is psychological trauma, which is referred to usually in the individual aspects of who we are. 
So things like a single event or multiple events can happen in your life that can alter your brain chemistry, it can alter your biology, and really interfere with your overall functioning. We move on to more of a collective trauma, which is this intergenerational trauma. Intergenerational trauma simply is the passing on of trauma from one generation to the next. This can happen biologically. We know now through epigenetics that the things that happened to people that came before us are literally alive and can be activated within our DNA because of markers and imprints that happened to them generations ago. So that's biologically, but we also know behaviorally that we can pick up things in our environment and we can emulate them because it's what we learned and it's what we knew. So that's how the intergenerational transmission can happen. More specifically for Native people, um, we know, know historical trauma, which is an emotional and psychological wounding because of massive group trauma. We know that for um, here in, in what we call Turtle Island or the US, um, it's been centuries upon centuries of genocide and various things that have brought us to conditions today. That is the most frequent question I hear from non-Native people who don't know about the true history and know about how it affects their families still today. They ask the question, why do so many Native people struggle with alcoholism? Why are the suicide rates so high? Why is there poverty? We can't even broach that question without first understanding the history and how um, it's, not a, it's not a blaming game. It's not to say, you know, that we, we're owed these things. It's simply about education and connecting um, so that we can move forward. So the most common um, example, um, there's something called the boarding school era that started in the early 1800s. This is a picture of Carlisle boarding school. And what happened um, generation after generation is that native children through government law were taken from their families, kidnapped and placed in these schools so that they could be assimilated and become the best white Christianized version um, that they could be. So in this process, we know through lots of documentation and stories from survivors and family members of those survivors that sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, be, the moment they walked through the doors, they had to cut their hair. They were told that they were sinful for being born native. And all of these things, as you can tell, are traumatic. So we have whole generations of our native youth that were disrupted from their kinship systems and everything that kept them feeling whole and safe. And if you think about generation after generation, when they would leave the school and try to go out and have families, you can imagine how difficult that was. Shame upon shame. So there's a famous saying called, kill the Indian, save the man. This picture really does uh, illuminate that, how our people has such a rich, beautiful connection to the land, to stories, through um, the clothing that we wore, the foods, very intelligent ecological systems that we knew how to navigate. All of those things are present, right? And then you move to the picture to the next, or the next picture over, and it really does show the attempt to kill the Indian and save the man. So as you can imagine, um, when someone repeatedly tells you who you inherently are is wrong, everything about you is wrong, and in order to be saved, you have to become this other person. You'll never fully be that person, but if you follow us enough, maybe you can be saved. What happens is something called internalized oppression. Internalized oppression is the act of feeling as if you no longer need any of the external abuse because you're doing it to yourself. So that internalized oppression becomes um, really a poison for your heart and your mind, and the basis of it is shame. So again, this is not a native-only experience, right? I think everyone can relate to something in their lives where they felt maybe was very negative or difficult or abusive, and how you internalize that to be true. And we know that those things are not true. What happens in our communities is sometimes this internalized oppression turns to what we call lateral oppression. Lateral oppression is where we um, are turning against each other as Native people at different times. 
resources, just different things. And because we haven't navigated the space yet of understanding how to heal from all of the traumas that have been handed down to us. So epigenetics um, is an amazing growing body of research that really talks about um, how the events in our environment can leave imprints within our genetic makeup. And like I said earlier, those things can be handed down to the next generation. Dr. Eduardo Duran um, does amazing work in this field, and he talks about something called the soul wound. And I feel like it's really important when we're having this discussion to mention the soul wound because he talks about how the elders taught that the soul wound is where intergenerational historical trauma, it flows, it goes to a place where no blood flows, which means our spirit. It means our soul. And for Native people, for us to continue thriving and healing things that our ancestors simply did not have the space or time to heal, because they were literally in survival mode, that we have a unique opportunity right now to heal things within our genetic makeup because we have more of a, a stable ground and more tools and things that they did not. So when I was younger, in my 20s, and I, around the time I had this dream, it felt so heavy what our people were going through, what my family was going through. It felt so heavy that some days I felt like I couldn't breathe. What I realize now, what once felt like a burden, feels like a privilege and feels like a responsibility to be able to honor them by creating changes in my life today and being able to see that maybe there's some things that I was born into that are not only difficult and traumatic, but are profound and powerful. So some of the symptoms that are unique to intergenerational trauma and historical trauma um, are that it's not just the typical PTSD symptoms. A lot of Native people in Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart's research actually report having flashbacks or nightmares of being a part of some form of genocide or battle or attack. And so this is something that really, I think, illuminates that epigenetics is very much real and alive in a spiritual way as well for our people. I wanna mention uh, my best friend. I always bring him with me into talks because he is a profound soul. He's no longer here in the physical form, but he is here in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual way. And before he passed, he and I had many, many talks about doing this very work together. And I was going to be the, the kid sister that let him come up front because he was handsome, charming, knowledgeable, knew the songs. He was all of those things. And I was the kid sister that would support him. So when he left, he passed away of addiction. And so he's very much a part of this intergenerational story, this historical trauma. He embodies to me the, the polarities of what trauma can bring. We know when we experience great trauma, um, we, we experience things in black and white. Things are all or nothing. I'm either safe or I'm terrified. And my brother did embody those things. And I used to feel such deep, deep pain about that. But what I realize now is his, his life had so much meaning and so much power and he was such a teacher that even though he left the earth realm in his late 30s, um, he taught us so much while he was here about healing and his hopes for he helping our people to heal that I had to bring him with me in this talk today because I know that he would be so proud of all the work we're doing. And yes, that's the two of us as little babies reading a book together. He did tell me um, a couple years before he passed away, we were looking at that picture and you can't see it in this picture, but we're looking at a book. And he said, you know, sister, I distinctly remember pointing my finger so that I could look like I was like really smart and old and the cool older brother. <laughs> and he said, I had no idea what was on that book, but I just was, and that was so my brother. So as, as we think about the people we love around us, not only as native people, but human beings, we think about the different ways that we can heal. I think we have to really broaden our horizons and really shift the paradigm of what healing looks like 
It's different for every person. We need our clinical westernized interventions. We need those things. But in addition to that, we need to go back to the roots of what it means to be human, how to learn to be in our bodies again, how to learn how to be a good relative. Some of these things can only happen through community. And so we need to provide spaces and build healthy communities to be able to um, address some of these things. So um, one thing I wanted to mention that's really powerful in terms of um, creating healing, we've talked a lot about the trauma itself, but there are many things that we do to remember our ancestors, and one of them is called the Bigfoot Ride. And if you don't know about this ride, you should really research it, look into it. It's a powerful way that our, through a dream, the man who started this received this dream of, you need to go back and honor your ancestors. You need to pray for their spirits. And so they go on this ride through the, the winter and they end up at the site and they say prayers. Now, we can't take back the trauma, the difficult things that happen, but a big part of healing our traumas, both individually and collectively, is finding a way to integrate those difficult, painful things into our daily existence that has purpose and meaning. So I'd like to leave you all with contemplating what it is that you carry for your ancestors, for your family, for your lineage, that maybe you run from, that maybe there's a lot of fear that you don't wanna face. It's actually a really unique, powerful opportunity every time you feel anxiety and grief and all of those things to look deep inside and realize that you do have all of the resources, you have all of that energy to be able to heal. And I end with this, my brother, it's one of the last pictures that he took. He uh, passed away in Hawaii. And um, I bring the water back in because in the beginning we talked about the power of water. Water itself is neither good nor bad, it's sacred. And the water in this picture reminds me of the stillness that he had even through his difficulties and his trauma and his addictions. Um, we have the ability to heal. And now I think of the grief that I carried so profoundly after he passed, and I feel still. I feel like the water is still because I know that he's with me. Thank you. Thank you.